So now uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about strings. I believe that the uh, we've already had one lesson on strings where I showed you substring and length. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, by the way, I, I revised the list of methods. I don't know if any of you wrote them down in your notes, but there were a couple missing and a couple were misfiled, so I just rewrote them over there. Uh, it, it's not that important. We're going to go over every single one. Uh, but today, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how strings are different from most other, most other objects inside Java because strings are immutable, just like this sign over here says, and also because strings are pooled. We'll talk about the immutability part today, and we'll talk about the pooled part on Thursday. In order to understand what it means to be immutable, I want to first review with you how primitives and regular objects are not, Im not immutable and to show you how strings are different. So I want you to imagine, for example, that inside we have some code in Java, and uh, inside this code, uh, we have this variable int uh, x, and we set it equal to 3. And then over here, we do uh, int uh, y equals x, like that. And my first question to you is, after we're done, What's going to be in the x variable and what's going to be in the y variable? Uh, let's see here. Uh, Mr. Manet, sir, look up here. Uh, after I run this code, if I were to print x and y, what would print for x and what would print for y? Uh, x would be printed as 3 and y would also be 3. Okay, so they both be 3. We're good there, right? Now let's say I go and change one of them. Let's say I go uh, x equals 7 here like that. And then down here, once again, I print x and y. My question is, are they both going to be 7, or is y still going to be 3? What do you think? Ms. Smithika, what do you think? So I did x equals 3, and then I did y equals x, and then I changed x to 7. My question is, when I print y, what's going to print, 3 or 7? 3. Very good. So what's happening here is that when I build this x here, like this int x, it builds this box, and it calls it x, and it puts a 3 in there, like that. And then when I build this y box over here, it takes the value that's in the x box, and it copies the 3 into here, like that. So later on, if I go into this box marked x and change it to a 7, you can see the Y still has the 3 in it. You see that, right? Okay, so let's look at a different situation now. Let's now say I have this dog here. I'll call it D1 is equal to new dog. And we'll say that uh, you can tell the dog its name right away. So I'll name the dog with my dog's name, Luna, like that. So now I've created this dog D1, and the dog's name is Luna. Now later on, if I go dog D2 equals D1, have I made a completely different dog? That's my question. What do you think? Mr. Garofalo, what do you think? That's correct. There's, most of the time, if you want to make a new object, you have to use a special word to make it. What word is that? Yes, sir. New. That's this keyword new. You see, I didn't use that keyword here to make this other dog, supposedly. So what's happening here is, if I look at memory, here's the memory where my Luna dog is created, right? So here's Luna. Here's some other information about the dog here. And what's happening here is that D1 is pointing here. And then when I go like this, D2 is also pointing to the same dog. Now, on an operating system like Windows, this has a special name when two things are pointing to the same file. What's that called in, in Windows? What's that called? You've done it with your files before. Anyone? Yes, sir. Is it pooling? <laughs> no. Begins with an S. Yes, sir. Short. It's a shortcut. Like sometimes you can like have a file sitting in some deep folder somewhere and you can put a shortcut to it to your desktop, right? So my point is this now. If I go over here now and I go d2.setName, right? I go d2.setName and I change the dog's name, d2's name to tuna, right? Like that. 
I'll give a piece of candy out to anyone who can guess what name I wanted to give my dog. I'll give you a hint that my daughters were very young at the time. They didn't like this name, so they insisted on Luna. But does anybody want to take a guess? Yes. Was it Tuna? No. Anyone else want to guess? You said it in class one time. I did? Yeah. A few classes ago. No one wants to guess? Yes, sir. No. Who said it? That's the right answer, sir. Okay. He's a, he's a fawn-colored. She's a fawn-colored dog. It looks like coffee. Java is my life. You should... Worry, well, anyway. Uh, so uh, I owe you a piece of candy, sir. Okay. So anyway, now you have these two pointers. I've got to edit all that out now when I make the video. Uh, so you got these two pointers. They're all both pointing to Luna. And then I changed D2's name to Tuna. And then I'm going to print, right, system out print, and I'm going to print d1.getName. And my question is, when I, when I print the, the first dog's name, is it still going to be Luna or is it going to be Tuna now? What do you think, Ms. Caitlin? It's going to be Tuna. It's going to be Tuna because, you see, when I went in here and I changed the name for D2, it went in here. There's only one dog here in the memory. See that? So then later on when I asked D1 its name, which is over here, it's been changed. So in, in operating uh, systems, this is called a shortcut. What's it called on Apple? Does it have the same name? Anyone know? Like it? Shortcut. It's a shortcut as well? OK. So that's a shortcut. But in Java, this is not called a shortcut. What's this called? Who knows? Anyone? It's called a shallow copy. In essence, I only have one dog. I just have two things that are pointing to the dog. Same dog. See, that's the dog in memory right there, like that. And I wanted to sort of preface today's lecture by telling you about all this, because strings do not work like I showed you with primitives, and they don't work like I showed you here with, dog with the dog class. Strings have a weird behavior, and I, I, I want to talk to you about that. OK. So let's go like this. Let's go string s equals a, b, c. Now, already you should be looking at this thinking, huh, that's kind of weird. Usually when we create uh, objects using a uh, template known as a class, right, usually we use the keyword new. So you would expect that it would be like this instead. It would be like string. Uh, I'll give it a different letter. T equals new string, and then, you know, like DEF or something like that. And indeed, you can make a string like this, and we'll talk about that on Thursday, what the difference is. But most of the time, we don't do that because it's a pain. We just go like that. So the Java compiler gives you a shortcut for building strings where you don't have to use the keyword new. You see that, right? OK, so we don't usually do that. We usually just do that. Now here's the really weird part here. If I go like this, if I go, let's say I have that S string, right? Then I go string. So let's draw what's happening in memory. In memory, there's this ABC string. And then there's this S that's pointing to it like that, right? S that's pointing to it. And then, um, you know what, let me, let me do it this way. Um, and let's just say that I go in here and uh, let's say I go um, S uh, plus equals the letter D here like that. So what I'm basically changing is I'm, I want to change S from saying ABC and I want to change it to say ABCD. Like that. You see that? Alternatively, instead of doing this, I could have also done S equals S plus the letter D. That would be another way. These two would be the same thing. So change it, right? Now, your first thought would be, OK, the runtime machine goes in here where S is pointing, and it just adds a D to the end of this existing string. But it doesn't do that. And the reason it doesn't do that is that strings are immutable. What does the word immutable mean in English? Anyone heard that word before? Mr. Pandali, what does it mean, sir? It be can't be changed. And so you're like, well, what do you mean it can't be changed? Are you changing it here? 
So here's what actually happens. When you tell the compiler or the run machine, Java runtime machine, that you want to add a, an extra letter to the end of the string, it makes a whole new string. It goes A, B, sorry, it goes A, B, C, D. And then when you go S equals, like this, right? It says, oh, S isn't pointing up here anymore. Now it's pointing down there. Meanwhile, you see the old ABC is still sitting there, unchanged, because it can't change. It's immutable. And then whatever, uh, this is not really part of the course, but what happens is if you don't have anything else pointing to this, there's another task that runs called the garbage collector that eventually recoups this memory and puts it back into the pool so that the, your program can reuse that same memory later, but we don't have to worry about that for now. But my point is that when you modify a string, it doesn't go in and change the existing string. It makes a whole new one. And you're like, well, who cares? Here's why you care. Let me explain to you. Let's say I have a string like this. String. Oops. String. S equals A, B, C. Like that. Okay? Now, there's a method that we're going to learn. I'll teach it to you right now called two uppercase. You can probably guess what two uppercase does. If I go s dot two uppercase like this, right? It takes the letters and it converts everything to uppercase. Then, if you were to print, like that, you will be surprised to find that it still shows the small ABC. And you're like, it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is because strings are immutable. And I'm going to show you now how to fix this code. This code has a major bug in it. So originally, you wrote string s equals ABC. So in the memory, it creates this string called ABC. And it has s pointing to it, like that. Then you said, change it to uppercase. Well, it can't change this one because it's immutable. So it creates a whole new one down here. And it says, OK, there you go. And then you said, print s. Well, guess what? s is still pointing up here. So it prints the little abc. So my, my question is, what do I need to do here so that s now, instead of pointing here, is pointing there. I would like you to discuss that with your partner now. Miss Tamara, what's your guess? What have I forgotten to do up here? OK, I need to go like this, because once I do that, now this pointer is going to move and point to here. And now when I print the S, it prints the capital ABC. So with all of these string methods, because strings are immutable, it's important to reset the string pointer so that it'll point to the new string. Otherwise, you'll effectively have done nothing. So that's one of the really important parts of immutability. So these are the methods that we've gone over so far. We've taught you substring. We've taught you length. And today, I taught you to uppercase. And there's also a similar method called to lowercase, which I won't dwell on. But you can probably guess how that works. And now, uh, I think there's only one additional one I'm going to go over today. And that one is called compare to. That's listed as number four over there on that list on the board. Does anybody have any questions so far about this business about, yes, Mr. Degouge? So could you set in parameters for the two uppercase or lowercase to only make a certain part of the string uppercase or lowercase? No, the two uppercase method and the two lowercase method don't take parameters. So if you only want to change part of the string, then what you'd have to do here, sir, and I'm glad you brought this up uh, because I think I forgot to mention that these uh, string methods can be chained together. So let me show you what, what, what I mean by that. Let's say, so this would be here and then two upper 
lowercase, and then you'd still have to add in the lowercase c, so something like s dot substring uh, 2, 3, like that. So this would result in a, b, and then a little c here, like that. This would just convert the top two, the first two characters, and this would leave the last character untouched, like that. Okay, anybody have any questions about that? All right, uh, last topic for today. You know what, take another few minutes break right now, and then we'll go over one more thing. Okay, this substring, the 0, 2 would grab the AB, and then we would uppercase that part, and then the 2, 3 would grab the C. The first index, that would be 2. So the, the indexes here would be uh, 0, 1, and 2. So it's 2. And then it, it goes up to 3, but doesn't include the 3. So if you want to know how many letters are being grabbed, you just subtract the 2 from the 3. So here I'm just grabbing one letter. OK. All right. OK, we're going to practice a little bit with strings for a little while before I show you the compare to method. So to do that, let's go over to our favorite site, which, oops, not that one, over here to uh, westhillcs.com. And then we're going to come over here to the class page, and we're going to click on that. And that's going to take us to this page of tools that we have that allow us to do our work in this class. And we're going to look at this one called CSA Games. And it actually starts off on strings, it looks like. This game is called String Thing. And right now, you can see there is this string called Squirrel. And it's asking, what parts make up substring 3.5? Who wants to take a whack at it? Uh, OK, Mr. Deguj, what do you think? IR. The IR. So if you go IR, you can see, and then it gives you another one. And so this is just a little bit of practice on substring. So we're going to play that for just five minutes, and then we'll go on to the compare to method. If you get bored and it's too easy for you, then turn on the, the timer and the sound. The, the timer makes it a completely different game, because it adds the stress. If it gives you a, a substring with only one number, it starts there and goes to the rest, entire rest of it, yeah. This should help reinforce the whole substring idea. Substring is going to be in, in a lot of your quizzes, on the test, on the AP exam. I don't think there's ever been an AP exam without a substring or a question or two. So it's kind of important that you just. It'll get harder once we learn loops and combine the loops with the strings. OK, we'll come back to this CSA games later once we learn loops in unit four. And then strings will become much more challenging. Right now, it's very basic with the substring part. Still good to know, though. Good practice for you. Let's move on to another topic right now. And that topic is called the compare to method. <laughs> 